Thanks, Aaron. And it's great to be here and see some old friends and, uh, and meet some new people. And I hope that um, I have some things that will at least provoke some interesting comments and questions and discussion. Uh, uh, speaking of John Dewey, Dewey said um, once that it's better for philosophy to err on the side of engaged participation in the struggles and issues of the day than it is to maintain an immune monastic perfectionism. And sort of along those lines, my talks roughly, the first part is going to be uh, a very imperfect philosophy. So I'll present some of that. And then uh, the second half is some examples um, some, with some community-based work that I've been involved with. Uh, this photo here is the uh, University of Illinois where uh, Carol and I and uh, Cheng Chu and maybe some others here know quite well. Uh, it's, um, this is not the, the only view at Illinois. Often you see the, more often you see the cornfields and the soybean fields. I wanted to present that not only just to show you where I was coming from, but also to talk about the fact that we build universities, schools that often look very nice inside, but are disconnected from the world outside. Uh, as you know, many universities literally have walls around them, and uh, schools might as well have walls around them in terms of how they connect with, with their communities. Meanwhile, many people, and here I'm going to be concerned especially with young people, are um, suffering in different ways. They feel alienated from society. They see school as a waste of time. Uh, they engage in antisocial and destructive behavior. And I think this is true around the world. Uh, people in China are concerned about youth suicide. Uh, people in uh, Turkey concerned about youth with antisocial anti behavior. Meanwhile, many of our communities are, continue to be divided across race, religion, language, and other things. Uh, Daniel Allen, in a recent book called Talking to Strangers, said there's one thing that every parent around the world says to their four-year-old, and that's don't go talk to strangers. You might get hurt. But then she points out if we don't learn to talk to strangers, there's no way we can address any of the problems that confront us. So how do, we, how do we move beyond that idea of the safe home and, and safe small community to larger communities? And, and how do we do that in a way that we can address problems of health, economy, education, and so on? So the question I posed in the abstract and the title was, how can young people use new media for, communi for community action and personal growth? How can they address these two sides of their individual and the social? Uh, as you'll see in a minute, I want to reformulate that question a little bit. You've probably seen lists like this before. Uh, changes in the midst of these problems, we also have many changes underway. Innovations in transportation and communication. Uh, traditional methods of uh, moral development and of organizing society seem to be breaking down. Uh, there's a growing need for knowledge in all the affairs of life. And all of this points to a need for lifelong learning. Interestingly, this particular list uh, came from, also from John Dewey, 1902, uh, who saw these kinds of changes happening at the end of the 19th century and said, because of this, because of these things, we need new ways of thinking about schools and universities and libraries and museums, in fact, all the social institutions uh, that we're engaged with, that we can no longer think of them as in uh, set in little boxes. And of course, many people, including some in this room, have been looking at what happens to the technologies of today, 100 years after Dewey wrote that. And how is that changing, um, uh, uh, changing our world? Uh, Caroline, I have to say that, that your introduction to that special issue has got to be the most cited thing I've ever seen. <laughs> this, uh, with, uh, that online, online life is, is not separate from our 
offline life, that they're connected and that they can reinforce one another. Um, Michael Gerstein talks about effective use of ICTs. It's not just about having access to these tools, but how do we use them in ways that meet individual and collaborative goals? Um, Cheng Cho, who's here also, uh, talks about uh, finding ways that we can engage young people with new technologies that not only to learn the skills, but to understand uh, why things are done the way they are, that, that by through production, uh, youth can become more critical consumers, uh, more critically in, engaged in the world around them. Um, I have to say, though, that a lot of this work, is, um, as good as it is, has tended to have what I would call more of an individual focus. And I would apply this, uh, Aaron mentioned my year in, in Dublin. We did a project there in the schools and worked with about 30 uh, elementary and secondary schools looking at their use of new technologies. And in that and many of these studies, there tends to be almost necessarily a focus on individual engagement, learning, and creativity. That is, we, it's very hard to study the social, the community, the larger, thing, especially in a short time, which is what we have with most research projects. We have a year or maybe three years of real luxury. And so we tend to focus on, well, how does the individual participate in this, in this social system? Um, we also tend to take the conditions of social life as a given. We say, OK, this person's from a low-income community with a lot of uh, racism and prejudice. and uh, and that's sort of a given, and we want to now understand how this person can survive and how do they participate in that world. And similarly, we look at the new media and the new technologies as somewhat fixed. Uh, we don't have time to go in there during that year and, and change the way Facebook operates or change uh, what a wiki is. So we, we sort of take these things, we take the technologies and the communities as fixed entities and, and that leads us, I believe, to more of an individual focus in a lot of research. But as has been recognized, recognized for a long time, uh, individual growth can't be separated from community growth or from operation of community. Uh, George Counts was a critic of the Progressive Education Association. He was a progressive educator himself, but he was a critic of the movement because he said the movement had not really developed, elaborated a theory of social welfare. It hadn't defined what it meant to be a good society. To, and he said, without, without a sense of where you're trying to go with society, you can't have a good education. And too much, I believe, of our, univer our education at all levels, and I'm talking from you know, preschool through learning for uh, the elderly, too much of it focuses very much on this individual perspective, uh, in part because we have trouble talking about what a collective good might be. And so I want to reformulate my own question that I, I started with and to say, the question is really more, how do the individual and the community grow together? How can we begin to see not only the individual as an organic entity, but the community as an organic entity, something that changes and develops and responds, and so that the individual and, communi and community are in a dialectic relation. Um, this, too, is not a brand new idea. Uh, Richard Lewinton wrote about this in biology, uh, where he said the actual process of evolution seems best captured by the process of construction. Just as there can be no organism without an environment, there can be no environment without an organism. So um, Lewinton would, would point out, um, you know, when a tree grows, it immediately begins changing the environment around it. Its roots take over underground. The leaves provide uh, hummus and compost for other plants. Uh, the tree itself becomes a home for animals. Uh, uh, this happens with all organisms. Uh, Lynn Margulis, who recently who died last uh, November, I believe, was talked about this with the Gaia hypothesis and how the fact that 
bacterial mats around the world or what's made it possible for us to live. So there's this, this organic relationship between environment and individual. Uh, Dewey expressed this in trying to define community. And of course, there are many, many definitions of community. But for Dewey, what a community was was, was a process. It was a, the community is to extend the range and fullness of sharing in the intellectual and spiritual resources of the community. That's the very meaning of it. Community is something that we do. It's an action. It's not a, not a thing. In other words, we, it's not like community is a set of people with certain properties and relations. Community is an action that we engage in as we seek to share with one another. So, um, in that sense, it's related to Anthony Cohen's idea of communities of meaning, that communities are what we conceive them to be, and we, we conceive them to be things that allow us to share and work with one another. Um, I want to shift a little bit here to some more concrete examples to try to make this a little more um, real, uh, or, or at least connected to lived experience. Uh, in the 1930s in Spain, there was a project called the Misiones Pedagogicas. Um, this occurred during the Second Spanish Republic. And the concern then was that in many of the villages, there was a very high level of illiteracy and poverty. So there was people organized to take books and teachers out to the villages. They went to 5,000 villages bringing uh, teaching children and teaching parents and teaching teachers. So teaching people how to teach and how to learn. Um, it's a quite amazing project. And you can see some videos on YouTube of, of some of this if you're interested. A lot of it was based on the, the New School movement that uh, Iner de, los Ro, de los Rojo, Rijos um, had developed in the 19th century. Very similar to a lot of the work of Jane Addams and others in the United States. Um, Unfortunately, when Franco came in, he realized that the last thing he needed was 5,000 villages of educated peasants. And so one of the first things he did was to shut down the Misiones Pedagogicas. Um, but today, there are people in Spain like Ivan Yoran and Sara Valaigra who are trying to re, sort of reinvigorate or reinvent the Misiones Pedagogicas idea using new technologies and new, uh, new approaches. Another example, um, the village institutes in Turkey. Uh, the, during the 30s and 40s, there was a recognition in Turkey that, um, well, let me back up a little bit. When Ataturk came into Turkey in 1923, he wanted to create a modern, secular, independent uh, republic on the European style. And the first thing he did was to invite John Dewey who came to Turkey, spent three months, and wrote a report about Turkey, which is a fascinating document. Among the many things recommended, one was universal primary education and education for girls. And, but in order to bring that about, they needed teachers. So they created what were called these village institutes, where they would bring young people, maybe 15, 16 years old, together to share um, uh, art and music. Here they are playing uh, some kind of mandolin type instrument. Uh, they would learn the cultural life of the village. They would learn about the problems of the village and work with villagers to address those problems. They would t learn how to, how to do, but also how to teach practical skills as well as academic. And it was a wonderful example of how learning uh, books, uh, cultural resources can be brought together to address community problems. Um, unfortunately, during the Cold War in the 50s, uh, the United States was worried about Turkey being bordering with Russia across the Black Sea, and that this sounded, all this stuff sounded sort of communistic, and John Foster Dulles managed to shut down, Secretary of State John Foster Dulles managed to shut down the uh, um, the village institutes. Uh, when I was there a couple of years ago, I met an artist who was uh, a young person during the time of the institutes. And 
his take on it was shutting down the institutes meant that they killed Turkey's children. They murdered, murdered Tur Turkey's future. Uh, many of the examples I have have this kind of character that they happened and then they, when they became effective, they get shut down. Um, Maxine Green has written a lot about this and she's argued that we talk a lot about inclusion. We talk about making it possible for people to participate in the larger society, to, to learn dominant literacies, to, to learn technical skills, and that's great. But we also need to think that the social spaces, the communal spaces themselves need to be transformed. So it's not just a matter of admission and inclusion, it's a matter of transfer, transformation of our institutions in public places. Again, this, this is this idea that, that we cannot think of community or social system or society as a static entity. We, ha we have to think of it as something that, that we are continually creating and, and renewing. Um, Dewey's approach to this was to say, if we need lifelong learning, if we need knowledge work, if, if we can't judge a person by how big a block of stone they can lift up, but, but how well they can solve problems, we need a whole new way of thinking about what schooling is. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we've actually done what Dewey was suggesting in 1902, so we've still, still got some work to do. Um, Dewey argued first that the school system need to be, needed to be seen as part of the larger whole of social life. The, so the school is connected to, to the home, to the garden, the country, to businesses, universities. And these connections need to be real. And it's not just that we read about the farm. It's that we, we really connect through practice. And he even outlined how this might look in, as a building. He said the library could be at the center, uh, but you would have these spaces for doing things around the edges. And I, walking through the Barber Learning Center, I was sort of imagining, maybe is this, is this what he would have imagined? You know, you've got, it's not quite in the same building, but you've got the library nearby and then spaces for doing work. But he wanted to have um, you know, shops where you do manual things and that would help you understand laboratories and research. And uh, the kitchen, you'd learn to cook and that would help you understand gardening and nature but also understand the home. So this is back and forth between what goes on outside of the school and what can happen in the school. And then on the second floor, he wanted to have a museum. And the museum would be more physical uh, artifacts and would have other kinds of laboratories, places for art and music. Um, all of these were in little boxes, you might say, but the Dewey's idea of this was that there was an easy flow between them, that these, these were, this was a space not to um, teach a series of ideas and then test to see if you got them, this was a space for action in the world, and it was an action of learning with and from the community and then transforming the community. And I'm going to come, keep coming back to this transforming idea. Um, Jane Addams put it this way. Um, this was an answer to the question, why did we do Hull House? And I, I don't know if you're all familiar but, with this, but in the late 18, um, in 1889, I believe, uh, Ellen Gates Starr and... Uh, uh, Jane Addams started Hull House, which became a place for immigrants to settle into Chicago, and tens of thousands of immigrants from all over the world were brought into this. Uh, they, um, the, the, they were helped with working conditions in the factories, education in the schools, health care. To a large extent, the public health systems of the world can be traced back to the work at Hull House. Uh, they did research on, resident-based research on uh, uh, the spread of cholera and typhoid uh, and uh, drugs. Uh, there were problems with drug abuse at the time. They uh, established the first public baths in the U.S., the first little theater. Uh, they, um, uh, they had immigrants, they saw immigrants not as people who were deficient and had problems, but as people who each had funds of knowledge that they could contribute to the larger good. So everyone was expected to, to become a teacher and to help others learn. Um, Mexican immigrants taught pottery and weaving. Uh, 
uh, Greek immigrants taught about Greek mythology. I mean, it's almost sort of quaint today to look at some of that. But I think the fundamental idea behind it was that everyone knew something that no one else knew. Everyone could contribute to, to a greater good, so that they were building something together. They weren't just individuals brought into a fixed social system. They were individuals who participated in the creative construction of a new, new communities. She called it making the entire social organism democratic. So for her and Dewey and others, democracy had very little to do with voting and parliaments and the apparatus. That was a means. What democracy was about was, was um, something we enact in every aspect of our daily lives. So sitting next to someone on a bench talking, you're enacting democracy. And I'll, I'll have more to say about that, too. Um, as Dewey put it, democracy was not an alternative. You know, imagine associated life, and there's different ways. You could have a dictator, you could have a king, you could do this and this. Dewey said democracy is not an alternative to other principles of associated life. It's the very idea of community life itself. It's the very idea that we, we are trying to build something together, that we're connected. Not that we're all the same. We may have very different ideas. That may, the building can be very hard, but it's, it's that sense of association. So let me, let me move to um, a little more quickly here to a little more concrete examples. We had, in this project called Youth Community Informatics, which was funded by IMLS, we were interested in, could we help young people who were already using, um, you know, making videos and putting them on YouTube, using social media sites, uh, um, making CDs, all this, could we work with them to do more, to learn more, but also to use their skills in ways that contributed to the communities that they were involved in? Uh, one of the first projects we did was an idea of information spaces in the community. And this was not to teach young people about information spaces, but have them discover what they were and discover what it meant to, what, was in, what does it mean that, how do people in a community get information? So here's an example, a coffee shop, the planetarium, the student union, a nature center. We had this inquiry cycle idea, which was a, a asking questions, investigating, creating things, discussing, and then reflecting in a kind of um, cyclical process. Um, early on, we talked about different ways that how do people in your community get information? They may go to the library, but they may watch television. They may get it in many other ways. What, what are the ways that people find They came up with ideas of places to investigate. We also suggested places. They went to, this is about half of the places that we ended up going to. Uh, That's for Entertainment is a video store, which had not only videos, but had a bulletin board where it had things like, uh, I'm looking for a roommate, or I have a bi used bicycle to sell. Uh, the um, grocery store turns out to be a big information center. Um, <coughs> bronze plaques on campus. Uh, so these young people explored the spaces, made videos. They used GPS to find out where, where things were, made a GIS site. They uploaded video, music, text. Um, they also made podcasts or slideshows about this. They made e-zines. They used a variety of different media. Um, they shared this with others and got feedback both online and offline, and then reflected on what, what some of this might mean uh, in terms of how, do, how are people involved in communities? How might communities communicate better with one another? How might they do that uh, thing of share, full sharing of the intellectual resources of the community? But, I don't want to dwell on that. It was a lot of fun. We, I think we learned a lot from doing that. Um, I want to turn now to um, a site that I think has gone about as far as any place I've seen in, in trying to work out some of these ideas in the present, uh, in the present day. This is the um, Puerto Rican Cultural Center, which is in near Humboldt Park in Chicago, about three miles northwest of the downtown area. Um, it's a very diverse area ethnically. Um, 
uh, there are people, there are many people from the Caribbean and Latin America, more, also a lot of African Americans, more recently uh, Asian, uh, Muslim, European Americans, all, all sorts of people from all different uh, religions and areas of the world. But it has a very strong Puerto Rican influence. A lot of the leaders of the community have, um, uh, are committed to independence for Puerto Rico. But there are many challenges, uh, racism, violence, and so on. Uh, In 1967, there were Division Street on the main street. There were riots that led to some people being killed, uh, police cars being burned, buildings being burned. 1977, this happened again. Uh, leaders of the community said, this is not getting us anywhere. We have to have a different way of building community, not through, not through attacking. And they established, first of all, an alternative high school, then a cultural center, then started La Voz, which is a community newspaper, an economic development center, a community library, on and on and on. I have a brochure here if you'd like to look at. It's like 60 of the top activities they started, but there are many more. About 12 years ago, um, my department came involved with them. Uh, Sarai Lastra was a PhD student who did an ethnography at the, uh, in the community. Later, uh, others got involved with the community library. Uh, and other um, activities. Uh, then we started teaching courses on site, uh, both giving to the community, but also, as much as anything, drawing from the community. There's a saying in this community, vivir y ayudar a vivir, to live and help to live, or help others to live. Uh, they say, um, it's not live and let live. That's really like saying, I'm going to live my life and to hell with you. It's that life should be done in a way that uh, where we, we, help, we find ways to help others to live. An example of this is they, they have a daycare center with no real place for the ch little children to play outside. So they have to take them out on the sidewalk, which is noisy and sort of dirty. So they come to um, Mrs. Lopez's house, and she's up on the second floor. And the children, and they, say, they tell her they're going to be there at 10 in the morning. And she's an invalid. She can't get out. But she knows they're coming at 10. And they come, and they say, hello, Mrs. Lopez, and are you there? And she comes to the window and says, hi, children. Are you learning your ABCs? Can you sing the song? And so they sing A, B, C, D, E, F. OK, she says, great, and they talk to her a while. They tell the little children, they may be only three and four years old, but they have work to do in the community. And their work is to cheer up Mrs. Lopez. They tell Mrs. Lopez, well, you may be an invalid and you know, 90 years old, but you have work to do. You need to help the children learn to read and write. So everyone has, has a role to play. Um, this is their CETA clinic for AIDS. Um, uh, this is an example. I also have this book here I can show you. But um, they, young people start an anti-alcoholism campaign. There's a lot of drinking, a lot of drugs in the community. They, um, studied this, investigated it. They used the web to get information, but they read books. They, they wrote a book. This is the cover of, yeah, I think this, this is the cover of one of the books they did. And they, um, they made websites. They addressed not only the issue that to encourage young people to quit drinking or control drinking, but also the fact that um, you know, two out of three teenagers don't drink, and that there are negative attitudes about communities like this that can be uh, that need to be overcome with information. Um, they also concerned about gentrification. Three times this community has had to move. They make a safe, pleasant community with nice Puerto Rican restaurants and all of this, and then developers come in with and the rents go up and the Original people in the community have to move. Three times this has happened. And they view gentrification as a modern form of urban uh, colonialism. It's powerful people, interests coming in to take over indigenous resources. So they've developed a campaign with, called No Se Vende, which means don't sell, don't sell off our community. Uh, this has led to making posters, learning computer graphics, doing computer, um, 
community internet radio shows about gentrification, writing about this in the community newspaper, which is in both English and Spanish, both print and online. And so using these skills that we, I think we'd all like, would hope young people could be learning, but using them in the service of a, a purpose of building something in the community. Um, let me jump on. Uh, this particular slide is actually from Champaign. We're working with another group of kids, but in both communities, they did community asset mapping, meaning they would go out uh, into communities that people said, there's not much there, or I don't feel safe going there. Uh, Paseo Bariqua, which I've been talking about, uh, there are still taxi drivers who won't take you there. Uh, it's not legal. They're required by law to do it. But if you say, this is where I want to go, uh, I want to go to Division Street, they'll say, I'm off duty. Um, and so it's very important for communities like this to identify the assets they do have. And in this case, uh, here in Champaign, they went out and they, um, they found people who had jobs for young people. Uh, they found um, uh, community centers and resources that not everyone was aware of. They interviewed people. They uh, edited the videos. They wrote a narrative about what had happened. They uh, collected metadata relative to the particular sites, how many people they serve, what, uh, uh, when was it established, uh, uh, what kind of organization is it. They put all of this together in a geographic information system that could be used by uh, by both youth and, and parents and people outside. And I, I'll tell you, I learned a lot about my own city from looking at the site that they had made. They also do, um, that's the um, transit line noise. Um, I'm not going to play the whole thing. It's about eight minutes long. It's, you remember the song, We Are the World, which showed these people singing and holding hands. This is We Are Not the World. And it's, about, it's expressing how young people in this community feel that they're not accepted by the world around them. But through, through music, through art, they're able to express frustrations and, uh, and problems. They also work with the Mexican community in, uh, in Chicago and have made CDs, DVDs. Um, through that, they're learning video production. Uh, sound, they have a sound studio and so on. Uh, this is just, there's a culture academy that has, um, it's doing theater, podcasts, and many, many things. One of the important, I'm not gonna go through all the details. I'm happy to come back if you have questions, but one important thing to me that's come through on this is what, what is the meaning of online? A lot of what I read about the online world means participating in social media sites or using email, Twitter, communication tools, which is important, but it's not the only, there are many things that people are doing with digital media and digital tools. And these young people, in fact, in this particular community, they don't use social media sites. They, but they use computers to communicate in many other ways, like making, using computer graphics to make a beautiful poster that they put up in, in the community. I can say more about that if you're interested. Um, this is uh, the museum where they have Bombay Plena dancing. Uh, this is a the quick example here um, is that they, there's Newberry Library is a, a scholarly library in Chicago, wonderful place, but not a kind of place that would be ordinarily welcoming for street teenagers, uh, particularly from Paseo Bariqua, from the Division Street area. Uh, and some, on the other side, flip side, Paseo Bariqua teenagers are not very interested in going to any library, not even the Chicago Public Library, but certainly not the Newberry Library. But they came together around a project, which was to take the Newberry artifacts and texts 
create a new exhibit called Puerto Rico Through the Eyes of Others, because these texts, maps, and so on were created by Spanish conquerors and US government. And the young people studied these artifacts and then made um, interpretive signs that said, well, you have to understand, this map was made by a Spanish conqueror who was trying to conquer our people. And the Newberry showed this as a um, physical exhibit in the Newberry Library for the public. Then it became an online exhibit. Then it was extended to, um, uh, to contemporary Puerto Rican history and culture. So doing oral histories and so anyway, it's one of these things that becomes very generative, a sort of a life of its own. The UI, University of Illinois at Chicago says, well, how come we weren't included? We have a lot of Puerto Rican artifacts, and so they've wanted to get involved. And the Newberry Library says, well, we don't just have Puerto Rican. We have, uh, we have Chinese, we have Mexican, we have many other. Why don't, maybe we should be connecting with, with other communities. The, my favorite project I'm going to have to skip, and I'll just maybe save that for later discussion, but there's a wonderful um, urban agriculture project that uh, really brings a lot of these things together. Um, I just want to conclude, though, and have some time for questions and discussions. In this um, community, Paseo Bariqua, they have a very interesting idea of curriculum. Most discussions of curriculum that I hear within schools or university are about, you know, what are the subject areas and what do you learn at each level? So beginners should learn in astronomy, learn the names of the planets. And if you're more advanced, you learn about, com I don't know, comets or whatever. You know, you, you sort of ex ex build up in the cumulative kind of way. Um, but the subject matters tend to be separated from one from another. The, hist the history teacher doesn't know much about science and doesn't talk to the science teacher and so on. Furthermore, those ideas are separated by semesters or uh, other quarters or other periods so that what you learn one time doesn't seem to connect with what you learn the next time. And it's separated from the world. So those three kinds of disconnection they address. They say what curriculum is about is learning about the world in a connected way. Second, learning how to act responsibly in the world. And third, learning how to transform the world. Um, we took some of those ideas and the inquiry cycle idea and others, and we've, through our youth community informatics project, we put together a curriculum called Community as Curriculum. And here again, the idea is that curriculum isn't an idea in a book, but it's in our lived experience and our relation with others. And through that, we build um, our learning. We start with what we know, start with our experience. Um, I was just recently in the William James Hall at Harvard, which is the psychology building, and huge uh, carved letters. You see this quote from William James, that the community stagnates without the impulse of the individual. The impulse dies away without the sympathy of the community. And I think James, who was also a pragmatist along with Dewey and Adams and so on, saw very clearly that we can't really study one without the other. We can't have individual psychology here and social psychology here. Uh, we have to find ways to to bring those together. And I think this is the final quote. I just have to get this one in. Uh, so in Reconstruction and Philosophy, which is an early book of Dewey's, he said, democracy has many meanings, but if it has a moral meaning, it's found in resolving that the supreme test of all political institutions and industrial arrangements shall be the contribution they make to the all-around growth of every member of a society. Dewey meant by this corporations, hospitals, jails, schools, all of our institutions. And I think, I don't think I'd get much argument here if I'd say this, that on, on his test, many of our institutions today are horrible failures, that we, we, don't, even, we don't even think of the question. I mean, we, we don't even get up to level zero, which is to begin to say, how could these institutions uh, serve, help, help us develop better individuals who will in turn help us develop a better society? So thank you. And any so a few minutes for uh, yeah, back there. Um, what sort of divisions <coughs> were there between different methods of initiating discussion on community for different like age groups? Like was there a cutoff for like certain 
for increasing certain types of social media or website building or post media, what have you? You mean the different, the different groups use like, like different? Children who sing at ABC, feel the woman. Like, like, what ways do children increasingly involve themselves <clears throat> as they transition through these groups? Right. Um, well, I wish I could say more that you know the, the project had a long enough trajectory to really to answer your question to the level it deserves. Um, what I what I could say I think was that we we tried to work with different communities in a sort of dialogical kind of way. I mean, we would come in and say we have a bunch of ideas and we're happy to sh share, and more than anything, show you what some other communities have done, and then you come back and tell us what. What, um, what you want and what you see as important. So for example, we worked with a rural all-white school where uh, many of the kids were destined for lives working on the farm. And GPS has become very important there. And because and, you know, tractors are guided by GPS and, and you plot, the, I don't know. So when we talked, we said, well, uh, at Urbana Free Library, they're making movies, uh, and they're learning about techniques of fades and cross-cutting and all the angles and stuff. And, and at Paseo Bariqua, they're doing, uh, uh, working with the Newberry Library and so on. And they said, well, we want GPS. And I, we kept saying, but there are other things in the world, but, but no, GPS is what we want. And they, so for them, GPS became the center of a way of thinking about um, these kinds of activities. And that led to thinking of high school, because they were co very concerned about kids finishing school and would they want to go on to university or that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so we, um, I would say it, it, we tried to let it develop somewhat organically. And, and yes, of course, we did find um, uh, some of the tools were easier to use at different ages, but I, I can't say we looked at it systematically enough to really uh, uh, be very specific about that. Um, yeah, just, um, you, a lot of the examples you gave kind of rise and fall. They, they start and they, they, they fade away. So I'm, I'm wondering actually how much that's a, is that a natural thing one should expect in these projects, that they're, that they're rise and fall and um, we saw the idea, as you said, about going in with a fixed affordances and saying, okay, we're going to go in and put this program in. So do you have some suggestions on how to keep it fluid, as you were actually a little bit just explaining, but even in how you work with the community to, to um, you know, we're really used to the top down, put it in, you know, the traditional way you put the program in. So I know from the world, many discussions we've been in the co-evolution of these things, the, so yeah, there's more right. suggestions on, on the, how to keep it fluid enough so it keeps going. Yeah, um, you know, Joe Williamson, Joe Woman, J-O, uh, did a dissertation on uh, sustainability of National Science Foundation projects. And one of the things she found, there was this concern, you know, this, all this funding comes in, a bunch of stuff, a bunch of activity, and then the funding goes away and the project dies off. But she found that there were often changes in people that were sustained. So like uh, a teacher who'd been involved with the project became a leader in, in her school and might even get involved with the next project. And so she was, in fact, involved with several projects. Uh, but the sustainability was in her, not in the project itself. And I think that helped me see that I'm not terribly concerned about a project with a particular name like our youth community informatics. If that, has a natural life. What, what I would hope is that it, it makes a difference for the individuals and communities involved so that the next thing they do can, uh, can go forward. Um, beyond that, what I've seen in the places that seem to last is that they have more than simply the, um, the mechanism, the how of doing these things. I mean, they, you can have the technology, you can have activities, you can have all of that. But I think you also have to have um, a, a sense of purpose, a philosophy, a, an idea of what this is all about. And like Paseo Bariqua, which I think is going to keep going, you know, it'll, it, 
all signs are that it's going to keep going regardless of whether the University of Illinois is involved or anybody else. They're just, it's, they have a very explicit ideology, instead of beliefs, this vivir, iodar vivir, and community as curriculum, and, you know, and this is kind of thing that's learned and relearned and uh, um, indoctrinated, I guess you could say, uh, but it's, it certainly becomes a part of the way of thinking in the community, and it's that way of thinking that, that has a life beyond, beyond any particular set of activities. Um, and that, coming back to the quote I started with, that's why it's so important, as Dewey saw, to, that the philosophy, need, meaning ideas and our way of thinking about it, needs to be engaged with the social issues and problems of the day and not separated because you have to bring those two together. Um, if, the, if the philosophy is separated from our lived experience, it becomes hollow and meaningless. But if the lived experience, if we don't do the reflection and the sense making related to it, it risks becoming just a set of procedures that we, we do and then they die away. Chip, I, I wonder if you know about um, one initiative that has taken place in Canada, which you may not know about, uh, um, called the community-led public library movement. There was a three-year grant for three major public library systems, Vancouver Public Library, Toronto Public Library, Halifax Public Library, where specific um, professionals were hired to work uh, in the community to see, uh, particularly marginalized communities, to see what the needs were, what the desires were, um, and deliver. Uh, to and with the communities, rather than to, but with. Uh, and we have one of the people, um, one of the practitioners, the professionals from the Vancouver Public Library teaching a course on this for us in that category, the community-led library. It's a one-credit course, and she's taught it quite a number of times. And um, I know in terms of early literacy services at the Vancouver Public Library. Out of this, they hired about five professionals who are a team who spend all of their time working outside uh, the brick and mortar with the communities to deliver and assist them with what they want, what they identify as needed. And there's also work with Aboriginal communities. So um, I have a publication on that if you're interested. Yeah, I'd very much like to see it. I, you know, I think if you're a researcher in the US, you, you should come to Canada and, and see what things could be 10 years ahead and then you take it back and pretend that you invented it. That's, uh, that's sort of the, uh, because. The question there was, um, what do you know that from that brief description that might very like parallel that? Yeah, oh yeah, I've, and I've, I've actually read a little bit about this and uh, partly because I got involved, we just moved to Massachusetts and I got quickly stuck onto the strategic planning for the little library there. And they're really trying to take this more communitarian or community-based approach uh, to uh, thinking about you know, what should the library be even. You know, not, not just sort of how, to, how should the collection change, but sort of what, what is its role in the community. And um, yeah, I think, it's, uh, I think it's very much in the spirit of the kind of thing I'm talking about. And what What's, um, what's important and maybe a test of these kinds of things are, is, are they generative? Do they, do they solve that particular problem, like make a better library? I mean, that's great. But if it stops there, I think we, we have too many problems in the world. It's got to be somehow that, that in doing that, we learn something that also helps us make a better transit system or something. You know, we, we begin to develop uh, ways of thinking and approaches that, that grow beyond the initial problem. And that's, that's a hard call to make. I mean, the, but I think that's, that's the kind of direction to go. Yeah. I think you able to monitor um, the impact that um, a civil rights has had in the youth. Some of the studies that represents um, maybe the increase of crimes or drug abuse. Yeah, there have um, been a number of things. Um, 
the, um, at one point, I think they had like 25% high school graduation rate, and it's up around 85% now. And many of the youth are going on to higher education. Um, at one point, they had gotten down to something like 4% occupancy on some of the, the major buildings. I mean, they just had these empty buildings that were, people were, the landlords were burning for uh, insurance money. So they had, I think one year they had 400 fires in the area. It was really horrible. And they've gotten up to very high building occupancy. I don't know the exact percentage, but it's like 90%. Uh, and perhaps one of the best measures is they're getting increased gentrification pressure. Because uh, the more they do this, the more young urban professionals say, gee, that would be a great place to live. I could get a cheap apartment and great Puerto Rican food and all this dancing, music, and you know, and it is nice. And so at the night, I, one of the slides was of their nightclub. They have a nightclub with, uh, it's alcohol free, drug free, and the only rules are no racist, sexist, or homophobic language. But you can, otherwise, it's all kinds of productions, 140 performances a year, poetry, music, video, all this stuff, theater. Um, so one night, there's a young couple there, a young professional couple of lawyers, I think. And they were sitting there and enjoying the music. And then they looked at this poster that uh, said, uh, no yuppies, no, you know, no more, uh, uh, no gentrification. And so they asked the young performers, they said, well, does that mean you don't want us here? What, what's, what's going on? And I thought the, the response of the leaders of the community was really interesting. They said, um, they didn't have an easy answer. They just said, this is good because this is how our young people need to learn democracy. That it's not like a set of rules or procedures. It's about balancing between competing interests. You like, you like these young people, you're glad they enjoy the music, but you also feel like you're fighting gentrification. Well, now you have to really confront what are your values and how do you uh, do, do you want to say, well, we welcome them in to pay at the nightclub, but we don't welcome them to live here? You know, how do you, how do you deal with that? Um, yeah. I just, I don't have a, a well-articulated question, but maybe if I battle on a bit, something uh, we can respond to. <laughs> but it's around the role of, well, you have youth informatics. So what's this term informatics? There's this... Um, Community informatics has been critiqued in the past for introducing, here's a tool, and this tool, will fit. But, but clearly you see a relationship there with the information tools and with information professionals by having people who are in the um, guess this program involved in this. What's, what's unique about the tools or the, or the training that people from these kinds of programs have that they can contribute? Well, I think, you know, when when folks like us say technology, we often mean information and communication technologies. Um, and those tools are you know, at the heart of communication today, which means it's at the heart of what it means to build community. So they're, they're extremely important. And as, they, as the technologies keep changing, uh, our understanding of them and interpretation of them and how we use them, uh, is, is really vital to how we, how we build community. Where I think community informatics has gone wrong at times is when it just puts the, the technology out there first and, and only that. Uh, I think we have to be willing to say, um, uh, well, like, like I mentioned the Paseo Bariquo, teenagers don't like social media sites. Uh, I asked them about uh, Mejente, which is uh, my people, or it's a, Latino, Latina uh, version of Facebook, I guess. And they, one of them said something like, that's not our real community. Our community is the people we talk with. And they, they just didn't, you know, to them it was important to not to take that on. And I think, I think we have to be open to people um, making critical choices about which technologies they use and how they use. But that doesn't mean that we don't help people use the technologies when they want or help them figure out how the tools might be more effective in their lives. Is that? Yeah, I just think that I find a lot of tension there around mm -hmm. um, when, you, when you come to a community 
and you want to work with them, you have what tool sets and technologies, whatever, and your ways of understanding and that negotiation, I think, is really important. Oh, it is. And, and uh, we actually have some papers in my group talking about some of these tensions and problems. Uh, like one of the things we really got big into, uh, Martin Walski had this course. It was one of the most popular courses in our GISLIS program on um, learning the hardware and software and networking necessary to set up a community technology center. And there have been, must be a hundred or more, have been set up around Illinois and some in other countries and so on uh, by, by students in the class. And more recently, though, we were working in East St. Louis and some graduate students went down and said, we're going to teach you how to set up a community technology center. And they said, what? We're not interested. You know? And, uh, and there was a there was a real tension there because, well, but wait, I'm coming here with all these neat, I've got, I've got the workbook now and I, <laughs> you know, all the, all the stuff that we didn't have. And it turned out they wanted to do um, sort of uh, TV-like video production. They wanted to do local news with cameras and record them, you know. And so I, th I think, um, yeah, I think the tensions are very real. Um, I also think it's not always the case that you just say, well, that's what the community wants. I think there's a, there's a real value to dialogue and to say, well, but before you go off and do that, I want to tell you about something just so you have this additional information. Uh, our hour has drawn to a close, so um, please uh, join me in giving Chip a, a hand. And if uh, there's any other questions you'd like to uh, talk to them individually about, I think we'll have a little bit of time. Thank you again, Chip. Thank you.